members of the legislative council they are not electing the uh, members of the rajya sabha please try to remember this difference <laughs>
another house that will be representing the states the federal units we will call it as rajya sabha rajya sabha so we here itself make clear that lok sabha also known as the lower house and rajya sabha also known as the upper house so this is the system of bicameralism and try to remember the nomenclature of each house of the parliament right so basically these houses are upper and lower houses we also call them as lok sabha and rajya sabha <coughs> right now we will understand there is a balanced representation in both the houses so balanced uh, uh, representation means one house one house that is lok sabha it will be representing the collective will of the people so collective will will of the people whereas the rajya sabha the second chapter it will be representing the diverse federal units diverse federal units so in this way we have the constitutional makers have tried to give a uh, kind of balance representation through the uh, in the legislature so one particular house will be representing the people directly and the second house will be representing the uh, federal units i mean that means states so this is the composition of the houses now <coughs> let's try and understand the composition of rajya sabha so rajya sabha basically the constitution mandates that there should be a maximum of 250 members in the rajya sabha <coughs> so in that uh, 250 members 238 members will be representing the states that means the federal units right next 12 members these people have to be nominated these 12 members will be nominated members and they will be nominated by the president the president will nominate these two members to the rajya sabha the basically the background for nomination is so the people who are possessing special knowledge or practical experience in certain fields the fields are literature science art and social service please try to remember these words these words can be asked in the examination right so <coughs> why this uh, provision of nomination has been included so it included that people who are possessing uh, specialized knowledge or important knowledge they should be represented in the uh, rajya sabha however they may not have the capability to win contest and win the election so to rectify that uh, gap uh, the provision for nomination has been kept so <coughs> to bring in diverse knowledge or practical experience the provision for nomination has been kept and the president can nominate 12 members to the rajya sabha right <coughs> so representative from each state are elected by the members of state legislative assembly remember the members of the rajya sabha are elected by respective state legislative members of the state legislative assembly so the members of the legislative council they are not electing the uh, members of the rajya sabha please try to remember this difference right <coughs> for union territories to be represented in rajya sabha the parliament takes a takes the uh, decision it may prescribe a law and a method uh, in which uh, the union territories can represent uh, rep uh, can get a representation in the uh, rajya sabha so basically <coughs> the parliament has made certain acts uh, for providing representation in in case uh, delhi has uh, delhi a special case delhi union territory it has its own assembly so through that assembly a particular representative will come to the rajya sabha so those kind of arrangement has been made by parliament to provide uh, representation in rajya sabha for union territories right <coughs> now we will try to understand the unequal representation for states 
in the Rajya Sabha. This is very very important point when it comes to federalism in India. So federalism in India. So basically we have unequal federation. Unequal federation. We also call India as a quasi federal system. <coughs> quasi federal system. Which means not a complete federation. <coughs> uh, earlier also I have uh, pointed out uh, the federal system in India adapted only for the administrative convenience. Uh, it is not like USA where the states have come together through an agreement and form the federation. Here the territory of India has been divided into states, federal units only for the administrative convenience. Right. So for that matter unequal representation has been given to states because uh, people all over the country, people all over the country, they have to, they have to be represented equally, proportionally. So because of that reason, unequal distribution has been given to states uh, in the Rajya Sabha. So it ranges from single member in case of northeastern northeastern states like Nagaland to 31 members representing uh, popular states like Uttar Pradesh. So uh, remember this point, uh, unequal representation is there for the states in the Rajya Sabha, right. So this highlights the commitment to federal principles in ensuring equitable representation across the states and the union territories in the upper house of the parliament. So this is the unequal representation in Rajya Sabha. Now we will understand the composition of Lok Sabha, right. So Lok Sabha, the lower house. Indian Parliament, it exhibits diverse composition outlined by constitutional provisions. So it is a body of diverse people. Right. So <coughs> basically the constitution mandated that uh, a maximum of 530 people should be there in the uh, Lok Sabha and they are elected directly by the people. So here the members of the Lok Sabha are elected directly. So here direct election is there. Direct election. Through the method of adult suffrage. Adult suffrage means adults uh, who are 18 years of age and above. above. So they are eligible to, eligible to vote and uh, elect the members of the uh, Lok Sabha, right. So through the system of adult suffrage or adult voting system, the members of the Lok Sabha uh, will be elected directly, right. So the only age criterion is he should be the, uh, the voter and uh, he should be the Indian and he should be aged 18 years or above. So such people are eligible for voting uh, when it comes to the electing the members of the Lok Sabha, right. So no reservation of seats is mandated for any minority community. So please try to remember this point. There is no reservation of seats for minority uh, community communities. The only exception is scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes are given representation according to the proportion of their population. So there is reservation only for SCs and STs. There is reservation for no other community. But however, uh, remember, Women have been given 33% reservation uh, recently. The constitutional amendment has been made and it will uh, come, uh, come into effect once the census will be held. So uh, the popular name of that, uh, that bill is Nari Shakti Vandan Abhidhyan. Nari Shakti Vandan Abhidhyan. So try, try to remember this point earlier. Reservations were there for SCs and STs. Now, uh, the women also have been given uh, reservation, 33% reservation uh, <coughs> in the uh, Lok Sabha. Right. Uh, when it comes to representation for union territories in Lok Sabha, so not more than 20 representatives from union territories shall be directly elected in accordance with the laws prescribed by the parliament for this person. So uh, this for this purpose. So parliament 
can make a law prescribing these many number of uh, these many number of uh, representatives can hail from this particular union territory so uh, overall not more than 20 uh, representatives should be representing uh, union territories so this is the composition about the lok sabha so next uh, for electing a representative we have a system of territorial constituencies territorial constitu constituencies so before this you should be uh, clear about some things in india we follow the first past the post fptp first past the post system for elections to lok sabha right so we are not following proportional representation for lok sabha we are following proportional representation system for rajya sabha elections so for rajya sabha elections we are following the system of proportional representation with a single transferable vote so this is the met method followed for electing the members of the rajya sabha and for electing the members of lok sabha we are following the system of first past the post system so here the person who is getting uh, large number of votes i mean majority number of votes majority number of votes he will be declared as the winner so here in proportional rep uh, representation it is a kind of bit uh, difficult system and a complex system so basically the person should get 50% of the votes plus one vote here uh, when it comes to proportional representation so there are uh, reasons for adopting a uh, first past the post system for uh, lok sabha elections or direct elections uh, when it comes to mains when we discuss the lectures pertaining to mains examination we will go some uh, into some detail about uh, these two systems and we will understand the differences in these two systems and why india opted for uh, first past the post post system when it comes to direct direct elections so there are several reasons including historical reasons and the people are basically at that time during 1950s majority of the people were illiterate and they were not capable of understanding the uh, i mean complexities involved in the proportional representation system so these are basically these are the major reasons uh, when we discuss the major, uh, topics for mains we will uh, deal some more uh, we will deal in some more detail about this aspect for the prelims aspect please try to remember this much right so <coughs> to elect the members of both lok sabha and rajya sabha there will be territorial constituencies <coughs> so basically the delimitation commission delimitation commission it has the responsibility i mean it is constituted for every 10 10 years after the census by the president and it has the responsibility it has the duty of uh, i mean creating and adjusting the territorial constituencies uh it also has to adjust the territorial constituencies after every census that is its original mandate uh, but there are some amendments uh, regarding this one because there is a uh, inequality in growth of population when it comes to south india and north india and uh, it may lead to a asynchronous representation of people in parliament so because of that reason for the time being the adjustments are there but there is a hold on the number of uh, representatives that are hailing from each state uh, there is hold on that since 1971 census right <coughs> so basically the delimitation committee commission holds key here uh, when it when it comes to forming and adjusting the territorial constituencies right so this is basically made to ensure that proportional representation people are properly represented through their elected uh, members of parliament so <coughs> basically the main uh, principle here is one vote one value one person the principle here has to be uphold is uh, one vote one vote one one value so the principle is one person one vote one value so this principle has to be upheld as much as possible as far as possible when we conduct the elections so the efforts of the delimitation commission will be to uh, come close to 
as much as possible to this principle right so this is the principle behind the territorial constituencies right so the meticulous bifurcation of territorial constituencies this represents the democratic and inclusive electoral process to the lower house of the parliament so <clears throat> this is all about the territorial constituencies next <clears throat> next we will try to understand the qualifications for being a for eligible for contesting in for the uh, lok sabha elections so <clears throat> first of all very important criteria criteria is citizenship he or she should be the citizen of india this is to uh, ensure ensure the national allegiance the particular person or uh, representative shall not be eng uh, engaging in anti national activities so to ensure this aspect he should be the citizen of india right next age criteria so this is different for both rajya sabha and lok sabha so when it comes to rajya sabha he or she should be the person who is con contesting at least 30 years of age so at least he or she should be at least 30 years of age so when it comes to lok sabha the age limit is 25 years right so here uh, is certain difference in age limit has been prescribed because basically the rajya sabha requires experience and it acts as a uh, reconsideration body i mean it tries to influence the lok sabha to reconsider whatever the hasty decisions taken by the lok sabha so to uh, to provide that kind of services uh, the com composition should be kind of experience it should include experience so because of that reason there is a certain difference in age prescription so basically it is 30 plus years for rajya sabha and it is 25 years the person should be at least age of 25 years when it comes to lok sabha so the similarly the parliament reserves the right to prescribe additional qualifications to be elected as the member of parliament please try to remember this point also and it has acted upon this point and it has the prescribe several other qualifications when we discuss the representative uh, representation of people's act of 1951 we will understand those aspects also what are the conditions to be elected as a member of parliament so there are some disqualifications on which grounds the i mean the eligibility criteria i mean a person cannot be uh, disqualified for contesting election in elections for parliament so office of profit the person particular person should not be holding office of profit under uh, under the government of india or under any state government government excluding certain offices have been excluded uh, pa by parliament through legislation so basically the persons are not eligible to uh, contest in the elections though those who are holding the office of profit next is unsound of mind are uh, being declared, uh, declared of unsound of mind by a competent court so that person is also not eligible to contest in the contest in the elections for parliament next is insolvency so a person declared as uh, insolvent <coughs> so he cannot be he is not eligible to contest the elections next is non citizen ship uh, so if any particular is not a citizen of india or voluntarily acquires the citizenship a citizenship of another nation so in this case the person who acquires the citizenship of uh, citizenship of another nation he foregoes the citizenship of uh, citizenship of india and similarly if any person acknowledging the allegiance or adherence to foreign power so in all these cases the person becomes ineligible for contesting in the uh, parliament parliament elections next is statutory disqualification uh, disqualification as per any law enacted by the parliament so according to this there is a representation of people's act of 1951 there are many number of disqualifications on which members are uh, disqualified uh, from contesting in the elections for parliament so <coughs> when we discuss the representation of the people's act we will try to understand those disqualifications also so these are some of the disqualification 
described by the constitution and by the law next we will understand the duration of the houses time period of the houses so when it comes to rajya sabha so rajya sabha is permanent body so it is a continuous and permanent body so it is not subjected to dissolution please try to remember this uh, point so rajya sabha is a permanent and a continuous body there is no provision of disqualif uh, dissolution or dissolution of rajya sabha so this is has been uh, the rajya sabha rajya sabha has been kept as a permanent body to ensure continuity continuity in legislation and the governance process right so every second year after every two years one third of the members of the rajya sabha will <coughs> retire and uh, there will be elections to fill those posts in the beginning of the every third year so after every uh, after every two years one third of the members of the house will resign and there will be fresh elections held to fill those um, uh, posts so basically when it comes to the house the house is permanent right the house is permanent however the members mps of rajya sabha their tenure comes to like 6 year once they are elected to rajya sabha they will be in that position member of parliament or member of rajya sabha position for 6 years however the tenure of the house is it's permanent it is the house is not dissolved however when it comes to the tenure of the member it is 6 years right now we will understand the duration of the lok sabha so it is, it has a fixed term of 5 years right <coughs> however uh, the president retains the right to dissolve the house before the completion of its term and we have seen many number of examples uh, in many cases the the lok sabha has been dissolved before its complete term of 5 years has been completed so earlier also yesterday also when we discussing the prime minister we have seen that the prime minister can recommend the prime minister can recommend the dissolution of lok sabha uh, when uh, he or she is unable to form a stable government that is basically one of the major condition to so when when there is a hung hung lok sabha hung house uh, no particular party is holding absolute majority in the house form, forming and the continuation of the government becomes difficult so in that cases uh, the house can be dissolved earlier similarly <coughs> during the periods of emergency the normal term of lok sabha can extended <coughs> extended through the legislative action however the one time whenever the uh, term of the lok sabha is extended it should not uh, it should not be more than one year right so similarly uh, when uh, the uh, emergency ceases to exist so within the 6 months that house has to be uh, dissolved uh, if it crosses its tenure of 5 years so these are these are some of the exceptions the house can be dissolved before the 5 uh, years of tenure uh, if president uh, decides to do so however similarly during the emergencies the tenure of the house can be uh extended uh at a, uh, at a particular case it should not be more than one year so this is about the tenure of the house next we will see the sessions of the house right <coughs> so when we see the sessions of the house so basically the president has the power to authority to summon prorogue and dissolve the lower house of the parliament so basically he decides summoning proroguing and dissolving the lower house of the parliament <coughs> right so the president can summon each house of each house of the parliament at intervals ensuring that no more than 6 months elapse between last two sittings of the house so between one sitting and the other sitting there should not be more than 6 months duration right second thing is the provision this provision ensures that parliament convenes at least twice in an year with no more than 6 months gap between two uh, two periods two sessions so this has been incorporated to ensure 
continuity in policy making continuity or uh, uh, law making continue continuity in law making and ensuring smooth governance smooth governance right so uh, we will try and understand the definition what is meant by some particular words we have seen uh, here so session is the period during which parliament conducts is its business so basically we have three sessions generally we have three sessions the first one is budget session right it it will be during february march and april it goes till march because uh, the budgetary business has to be overseen here the second will will, uh, will be monsoon session so the second session will be monsoon session and the third one will be winter session right so this is uh, about the session there will be basically three sessions budget session monsoon session and winter session next we will understand the sitting so it is daily gatherings within a session focused on various uh, focusing on diverse and crucial matters they will be uh, the members will be assembling and discussing about the crucial matters including the legislative uh, proposals for legislation so this is the sitting next is adjournment so this is temporary halt that postpone further business for specific specified durations it can be hours it can be days or it can be weeks also so this is meant by adjournment right uh, now let's try and understand the difference between prorogation and dissolution prorogation and dissolution the prorogation means it is termination of a session indicating a pause in parliamentary proceeding so basically basically prorogation is temporary dissolution so temporarily for certain period certain months the activities of the parliament have been uh, suspended so this is <coughs> uh, this action terminates a session indicating a pause in the parliamentary proceedings however dissolution is it it ends the lower house term necessi necessitating a fresh election so if a, how, if the lok sabha is dissolved it requires a election i mean fresh election so this is the basic difference between prorogation and uh, dissolution next is uh, next we will try to understand about the presiding officers for both houses lok sabha and rajya sabha right to conduct the business smoothly to ensure there should be a leader uh, who will be presiding the houses of parliament so we have basically two officials first is speaker of the lok, lok sabha so he it is his duty to conduct the affairs of the lok sabha so he is the presiding official and <coughs> he is the presiding official when it comes to lok sabha right the speaker will be elected by the members of the lok sabha along with the deputy speaker so elections will be conducted once a new house uh, starts its its uh, sittings so in the initial stage stages itself once the elections are conducted the speaker both the speaker and the deputy speaker uh, will be elected <coughs> right now we will understand the responsibilities of the speaker so he presides over the sessions maintaining order and interpreting the rules and the procedure of the lok sabha so basically he oversees the conduct of the business conduct of the business this is his primary responsibility right so the speaker's authority in regulating the procedures is absolute absolute he is the final authority and this overseeing is out of the jurisdiction of the judiciary so judiciary cannot interfere in the affairs of the lok sabha or it, when it comes to the matter of the entire legislative process i mean the entire affairs of the uh, legislature or the parliament the judiciary cannot interfere right in the absence of quorum it becomes the speaker's duty 
to temporarily adjourn or suspend the sittings of the house. What is meant by quorum? Quorum is it is uh, to run a session to run the house at least ten parts ten percent of the membership. Ten percent of the membership of the these many members should be present in the house to conduct its business. This is quorum. So when quorum is not there, the president temporarily halts the business of the house. Right. Now, next, we will understand the voting rights of the speaker. So in first instance, the speaker do not vote. So it is to uphold the impartiality of the proceedings of the house. So in the first instance on a bill, so the speaker uh, do not vote. So if there is a tie, I mean, there are equal votes. Uh, for and against the bill to broke the tie to broke the tie the speaker uh, votes his uses his casting vote right so to break a tie the speaker can use his vote that is called as casting vote so in that case the speaker uses his voting power <coughs> similarly another powers are the speaker presides over joint, joint sittings of the houses uh, according to article 108 we will understand what is article 108 and what is joint sitting so the speaker presides over the joint sitting and the joint sitting will be called by the president whenever there is a, a disagreement between the two houses about a ordinary bill right so in case of money bill the speaker has very specialized powers he endo endorses a certificate and certifying that particular bill, bill as a money bill. So when it comes to money bill, as you all know, the Lok Sabha has specialized powers and the Rajya Sabha has limited powers. We can say effectively, practically, the Rajya Sabha, Rajya Sabha has no effective powers when it comes to money bill and uh, the Lok Sabha have, will have its own way when it comes to money bill. So the responsibility of certifying, certifying a bill as a money bill, so its authority lies with the Speaker of the Lok Sabha. Now we will understand the tenure and removal. So basically, the tenure of the Speaker aligns, uh, aligns with the tenure of the Lok Sabha, right? So the Speaker can be removed from his position uh, by passing a resolution in the House uh, by giving, serving a notice of 14 days. So during the consideration of removal uh, resolution, the speaker cannot preside the Lok Sabha. However, he has the right to speak and participate in the house proceedings, but he cannot, cannot preside over the house. So, uh, the role of the deputy speaker is whenever ab absence or vacancy arises in the position of the speaker, he will act as the, uh, he will preside the uh, proceedings of the Lok Sabha. So, that, that is the basic responsibility of the deputy speaker. Right, now we will uh, try and understand some aspects about the chairperson of the Rajya Sabha. So basically Rajya Sabha, for Rajya Sabha, the presiding officer is the chairperson. So basically this position comes as a ex officio position. Ex officio position. So the uh, vice, president of, uh, vice president of India, so he automatically assumes the position of chairperson of Rajya Sabha, right. The vice pres president of India will act as the, uh, uh, I mean de facto he will act as the chairperson of the Rajya Sabha. We have taken this practice from the United States of America. So in United States of America also this kind of practice is there. We have adopted this thing from there, right. So the vice president acts as the chairman of the uh, Rajya Sabha as long as they are not, he is not officiating as the president of India. We have studied earlier when we were uh, studying president, whenever a vacancy arises uh, to the position of president, the vice president starts acting as the president of India. So in those, that case, uh, the deputy, I mean, the vice president will not, will not preside over the Rajya Sabha. So then the deputy chairperson will take over the proceedings of the House. Right. So the chairperson's uh, tenure is coterminous with the tenure of the vice president. Right. So the, when it comes to powers and functions, 
they closely mirror those of the speaker of the lok sabha so the chairperson of the rajya sabha and the speaker of the lok sabha they have almost similar power the exceptions we have seen when it comes to money bills the speaker lok uh, speaker of the lok sabha has certain specific powers and also during the joint sittings joint sittings the speaker will preside over the joint sitting and not the chairperson of the lok uh, rajya sabha right so in these two cases when it comes to money bills and uh, presiding over the joint sittings the speaker of the lok sabha has this authority right so this is some information about the uh, officer or uh, presiding officers now we will try and understand the legislative role of the parliament role of the parliament <coughs> so as we all know it is the supreme legislative body the uh, parliament is the supreme legislative body in the, in the country so it has various roles the first important first and foremost important role is legislative role so the primary function of the uh, parliament is law making power right the primary function of the uh, parliament is law making power right so key role in money bills so when it comes to the lok sabha La Lok Sabha plays key role when when it comes to money bills, right? So the Lok Sabha plays a pivotal role when uh, in the process in the proceedings of the money bill. The bills are exclude exclusively introduced in Lok Sabha. So the money bills can only be introduced in Lok Sabha, not in Rajya Sabha. So <coughs> uh, the Rajya Sabha will get fourteen day period for action whether uh, it can pass, amend, or reject the bill. so in uh, the rajya sabha effectively or practically has only a limited role when it comes to the money bills right so whatever the changes or recommendations made by the lok sabha sorry rajya sabha the lok sabha has the uh, kind of uh, i mean options of it can completely ignore the recommendations or opinion of the rajya sabha when it comes to uh, money bills so <clears throat> so in case money bills the lok sabha has the prerogative so it can i mean it has the option of considering and not considering considering the uh, recommendations or opinions of the rajya sabha right when uh, and uh, later the money will will be sent to the consideration of the president and uh, the president will give his assent to the money bills because the money bills are or can only be introduced with the prior permission prior permission of the president so the president cannot the bill the money bill bill itself is introduced with the permission prior permission of the president so he has to give his assent once it is passed by the parliament right so when it comes to ordinary bills both the houses both rajya sabha and lok sabha have equal powers when it comes to ordinary bills so <coughs> the bills ordinary bills can be introduced in either of the houses whether uh, they can be introduced in lok sabha or they can be introduced in the rajya sabha also so whenever there is a disagreement for example if the lok sabha accepts the bill and the rajya sabha uh, uh, rejects the bill the president will call for a joint sitting according to the article 108 and uh, the joint sitting will be presided over by the speaker right so uh i mean based on the number of votes the in the joint sitting based on the number of votes uh, the bill will be uh, declared whether it is passed or not passed right when it comes to constitutional amendment as so <coughs> these uh, with respect to constitutional amendment bills also both the houses have equal powers so both rajya sabha and lok sabha have equal powers so the agreement of rajya sabha is imperative for amending the constitution reinforcing the collaborative nature of the amendment process so when it comes to normal bills normal bills and the constitutional amendment bills both the houses have equal power so when it comes to money bills the lok sabha has the upper hand right right next we will understand the uh, control over executive the uh, role of parliament in controlling the executive 
right so in previous classes we have understood india is following a system of separation of powers by the principle of checks and balances so basically there are three organs in the government one is executive the second is judiciary and the third one is legislature or parliament so in this case the legislature is parliament so according to the principle of checks and balances the control i mean the legislature controls and makes the executive accountable to its actions and decisions so it, the i mean the one of the major duties of the legislature or the parliament is to control the executive actions right so the methods let's uh, try and understand the met methods through which the parliament controls the executive the first one is collective responsibility yeah, yesterday we have understood the council of ministers council of ministers which is headed by the prime minister it is collectively responsible to lok sabha so it is collectively responsible to lok sabha so it continues in power the council of ministers or the government continues to be in power as long as it has the confidence of the lok sabha confidence of the lok sabha so once it loses the confidence of the lok sabha the government has to resign there is no other option so this is the importance of very very important uh, point when it comes to ensuring the accountability of the executive to the parliament right information oversight the lok sabha passes possesses the right to demand information on government policies and program so this is also one of the important powers next it has several control mechanisms to uh, to make the executive accountable so there are options like a uh, parl parliamentary questions to the minister we have a separate question hour to pose questions to the ministers and the ministers have to give responses answers answers to those questions next uh, the parliament also employs some adjournment motions call attention motions so these all are the tools in the hands of the parliament to make the executive accountable right similarly these procedures enable the members to highlight specific grievances of the people so this eliciting the government responses it will seek answers from the government right uh, another important weapon in the hands of the parliament are no confidence motion or censure motion whenever uh, the the parliament or the legislature is not a, not happy with the actions of the government uh, the members can move the no confidence no confidence motion which means there is no confidence on the present government so if this motion moves so the government has to resign right censure motion so in in certain cases whenever the legislature or the parliament is not happy with the actions or policies of the government it can censure the government censure is basically a warning a warning to the government that your performance is not up to the mark so it is a kind of warning to the government so all these uh, methods are to ensure the accountability of the executive or the government to the legislature <clears throat> similarly additional mechanisms also are also there that is short duration discussions private members bills so what are private members resolutions or bills so the private members means the members apart from the ministers so uh, when a when a minister introduces a bill or resolution that becomes public resolution or public bill so apart from any other member apart from the minister introduces a bill or resolution it is called private members bill or private members resolution so whenever a private member or a member of parliament is not happy with the government's action he can uh, i mean he can move a resolution so that is called private members resolution all right so there are similarly there are motions for modifying modifying statutory instruments the uh, the budget is also subjected to it right right so these are all the tools that are available to the legislature both the houses of parliament to ensure the accountability of the executive 
and these are all the controlling mechanisms that are there in the hands of the legislature <laughs> next we will try to understand the parliamentary control over public finance so when it comes to finance finance ensuring financial accountability of the government is also very very important because uh, i mean the parliament makes sure that public money is spent well and it is spent for the welfare of the people good of the people it is not wasted so the financial enforcing financial accountability also becomes very very important roles of the legislature right power over public uh, public finance we will see so <coughs> so the parliament should approve any modifications or imposition of new taxes right so approval of parliament becomes very very i mean must without the par approval of the parliament it should not the government should not in, uh, impose new taxes or raise the taxes right next for spending the money also spending the money also basically we ca we call it as appropriation bill so uh, to spend the money also from the uh, public exchequer that is consolidate of fund, consolidation fund of india consolidated fund of india the approval of the parliament is must so <coughs> to spend even a 1 rupee so the approval of the parliament becomes important so these are some of the measures to that are there in the hands of the legislature to enforce the financial accountability of the government <coughs> now now we will understand the representational role of the parliament right so basically the parliament is a body that represents the diverse interests and aspirations of the people so when we have a look at the parliament we can understand that the i mean the attire and the composition the attire and with the composition of members we can understand the diverse nature of india and how people from different regions different geographies different races so i mean different religions and from different cultures so how it is a uh, inclusive body how it is a diverse inclusive body so we can understand the principle of unity um amidst diversity or unity among diversity so we can understand this aspect if we take a look at the uh, house of the parliament houses of the parliament so basically it accommodates diverse uh, diverse regions and diverse people uh, diverse kinds of people the parliament tries to represent so uh, the it, the parliament also shows the inclusive inclusive membership right so we can understand diverse represent, uh, representation so the house comprises of members drawn from every corner of the country so providing a representation of various interests and demographies next is consensual politics so we can understand that basically majority of the decisions are taken on consensual basis this showing a converge convergence under a common platform so basically it also shows the consensus nature of the working so this setting facilitates the consensual politics through dialogue and a face to face interaction so basically the parliament works as a forum where the decisions major decisions pertaining to the country governance and the polity and governance of the country are taken right so it also works as a expression of masses needs and aspirations so it serves as a mirror reflecting the changing needs of the people so similarly uh, it also champions the public causes through various motions we have discussed just before it uh, tries to champion the cause of the people because it is basically representing the people representing the people so earlier we have seen that india works through the principle of representative democracy 
representative democracy where people elect elect the represent they representative to direct election and send these representatives to express their voice to i mean to express their voice at the parliament so at the parliamentary level so <coughs> this is the basic principle fundamental uh, principle behind the parliament or uh, legislature so in this way these representatives of people uh, people enforce the accountability on the executive or the government so in this way the parliament or the legislature also i mean champions the cause of the people next it is a people's institution so parliament as a people's institution and its members as representatives of the people champion the causes of the masses so it jealously guards the interest of the public so it will be proactive in responding jealously to the matters of public interest however uh, we can see we will understand when we when we discuss the main aspect uh, there are challenges in working in working of the parliament so the decline we will call this as decline of parliament so decline of parliament so basically in uh, when we discuss uh, mains we will go much more deeper into it so basically the number of sittings are coming down the number of days the number of days to um, for which the houses are assembling this is declining similarly party politics are also coming into the issue and also there is a mechanism of whip uh, so uh, when we elected the uh, when we i mean made the act of uh anti defection law the mechanism of whip came into uh, enforcement and there are challenges with the whip also and the whip challenge the inter intra party democracy and the individual members have practically lost their independence to express their grievances against the party so uh, basically these kind of uh, kind of issues are there and parliamentary authority i mean the power of the parliament power of the parliament to control executive it is uh, sliding down so for the means this uh, this aspect becomes very important we will make sure that when uh, we will discuss the uh, issues uh, in the means we will try to cover this aspect so theoretically when it comes to theory the parliament or the legislature has the responsibility of championing the cause of the people so basically uh, they are the representatives of the people so they should be re representing and ensuring the interest of the people so this is the fundamental and the basic principle right so this these are some of the theoretical aspects about the uh, houses of the parliament now we will try and understand the special powers of rajya sabha so when compared to lok sabha we i mean lok sabha has certain uh, special powers when it comes to money bills we have seen and when it comes to holding the executive accountable the lok sabha has special power similarly the rajya sabha uh, which represents the interest of the states at the central level it has certain special powers so one such a special power is a jurisdiction over state list under article 249 so whenever rajya sabha feels that the center should enact a law on the uh, states list so item listed in the state list so basically we have seventh schedule in which the powers are divided the subjects are divided into three list that is centers list and there is state list and there is also a concurrent list so uh, the state, central government has the power to enact on the subjects mentioned in the central list and the states have the responsibility or the power to enact on the states list mentioned mentions items mentioned in the states list and both center and state can enact on the items listed in the concurrent list however the center has the prerog prerog prerogative or upper hand so whenever the rajya sabha feels that there is a need uh, at the central level to enact on an item that is mentioned in the states list the rajya sabha passes a resolution approving that enactment under the article 249 so this is made possible to address the issue 
in a broader perspective so this particular power has been given to rajya sabha next is authority over all india services under article 312 so this is one of the special powers of the uh, <coughs> rajya sabha so here if a all india service has to be established uh, it has to be approved by rajya sabha through a resolution supported by two thirds majority that means special majority so if a all india service has to be established the rajya sabha should pass a resolution a special resolution approving that then a all india service can be established so there is a uh, debate about establishing all india judicial judicial services uh, akin to similar to ias indian Admin administrative service and indian police service so there is uh, a debate that all india judicial services shall also be formed so that is in the news so basically this power comes through the article 312 uh, 312 through which the rajya sabha can pass a resolution for creating a new all india service right so these are the special powers of the rajya sabha similarly uh, the rajya sabha has one more special power so when it comes to removal of the chairperson of the rajya sabha or the vice president vice president these proceedings or the resolution shall be introduced only in the no, rajya sabha not in the lok sabha so this is also one of the special powers of the rajya sabha so try to remember them there may be a question from this part also right exclusive powers of each house we have just understood the ex exclusive power of rajya sabha similarly the lok sabha has also exclusive powers when it comes to financial powers or money bills right and also holding collectively uh, holding the council of ministers collectively responsible for lok sabha responsibility for lok sabha to so the here the lok sabha has the prerogative right so these are the special powers of lok sabha and rajya sabha right now we will understand the parliamentary procedure in passing the bills what is the procedure for passing the bills so once the bill introduced by a particular minister or the uh, particular minister uh, when it com completes the process in both houses of the parliament if uh, the particular bill is passed by both the houses it will be submitted to the uh, submitted to the uh, ascendance of the president uh, acceptance of the president once the president uh, gives his assent the particular bill comes the act so briefly we will try to understand the procedure of passing of bills in the uh, parliament so right so stages in passing the bills so introduction a bill excluding the money bill money or financial uh, finance bills they can be introduced in either of the either houses of the parliament right only finance and money bills they have to introduce in only lok sabha not in rajya sabha rest of the bills they can be introduced in any house both the houses they can be introduced in either of the houses so introduction uh, introduction may be done by a minister uh, or a private member uh, what is a private member we have understood just before uh, the, the member who is not a minister that person is called as a private member they can also introduce the bill but that is very very rare very rarely the private members introduce uh, the bills uh basically they introduce a private member chooses to introduce a bill to express his her her dissent dissent over the government so basically uh, the initiation and introduction of bills takes place only by the minister right after introduction so various may motions can be proposed so after the bill will be considered uh, will will be considered for passing or the bill may be considered for passing or it can be referred to a select committee to examine the aspects of the bill so next it will be circulated for public information uh, right the bill will be circulated to uh, to collect the opinion of the people about the bill right report by the select committee so the select committee will examine the bill in some detail and it will submit it it's a report right so 
uh, after submit submission of the uh, submission of the report by the select committee the bill will be considered and it will be passed next after pa passed by one particular house the bill will be submitted to other house second house for consideration so in the second house also the bill goes through the same process introduction uh, considering i mean considering it for passage or uh, i mean uh, submitting it to a select committee to to examine the aspects of the bill and uh, pass it afterwards pass it so right so whenever if both houses of the parliament pass that bill it will be submitted to the president it will be sub submitted for consideration of the president and the president can give his assent if he gives his assent that bill becomes act so if there is a acceptance by one house and uh, the other house rejects the bill so this will lead to joint sitting if it is ordinary bill otherwise uh, if it is a constitutional amendment amendment bill the uh, there is no provision of a joint sitting and uh, the bill remains as rejected right so similarly when uh, a particular bill is submitted for the assent of the president the president can give his assent in this case it becomes a law or he can re return the bill for reconsideration so he can consider the bill uh, for reconsideration or another power also he has he can withhold his assent withhold his or has assent we call this as pocket veto so the president also can uh, the president can give his assent he can withhold his assent or he can send the bill for reconsideration here when once uh, the bill is sent back by the president the the uh, parliament has the options i like reconsidering it and uh, making some adjustments or amendments and uh, again passing the bill uh, in both the houses and uh, submitting for the consideration of the president or it can submit the bill as it is for the approval of the president so in any case the president has to give his assent in the second case once the bill is returned and the parliament whether it chooses to make the amendment suggested by the president or not uh, if uh, once again the bill comes to consideration of the president the president has to give his assent right right so these are all the aspects this is the information about the passage of the bill because of the paucity of time i am unable to cover the uh, there are important i mean there are three important committees when it comes to ensuring the accountability of the <coughs> uh, executive uh, one is estimates committee estimates committee next is psc public uh, public out, accounts committee and the third one is committee on public undertakings so these are three important committees when it comes to financial accountability of the executive so try to read some information about these committees right so try to uh, practice some uh, previous questions that are asked from this topic uh, topic very very important topic so so this is all for this day so thank you for joining the lecture see you next time bye Thank you.